good to go. Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to, let's see, this is the February uh, edition of our Big Bear Valley Astronomical Society virtual lecture series. Tonight, uh, we're very fortunate to have a veteran of Big Bear from many years ago, Doug Raven. Uh, Dr. Doug Graham received his PhD from the California Institute of Technology. In 2000, he joined NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center and is currently, I hope this bio is up to date, I saw several online, uh, is currently Deputy Director of Heliophysics uh, Science Division. Is that the proper title? Yes, sounds oh. good. Close okay. enough. <laughs> Some shit I never remember. Okay, I, uh, that's what it's said. Uh, that I hope I don't have to do. A lot of things <laughs> online don't quite agree, so I tried to figure what sounded the most uh, most up to date. Raven was the principal investigator on the extreme ultraviolet normal incident spectrograph, UNIF sounding rocket investigation through its three successful flights that probed the variability of the corona and transition, transition regions on time scales as short as 20 seconds. He is deputy project scientist for the Solar Radiation and Climate Experiment, SOURCE. Launched in 2004, it's still providing benchmark measurements of the sun's total and spectral irradiance. He's also instrument scientist for the Solar and Lunar Absolute Reflectance Imaging Spectrometer, Solaris. I almost got that out in one breath. Tonight, however, he'll be speaking on a concept called the optical sieve, which could be used to produce extremely lightweight, low-cost, yet high-resolution telescopes. Please welcome Dr. Doug Raven. Thank you, Bud. Uh, and thanks to, to you and uh, Teresa for inviting me uh, to give this talk and have a chance to speak with any folk, folks who are listening. Folks are folk anyway. <laughs> um, just to add to uh, your uh, kind introduction that I was, like uh, many astronomers, uh, an amateur before I was a uh, professional. Uh, in fact, made my first telescope mirror when I was 12 at the Griffith Observatory in L.A. Uh, and it's true, I went off to, uh, to Harvard as an undergraduate, and uh, my first summer job as an undergraduate was at Big Bear, where I uh, opened the telescope. Yeah. And uh, in conjunction with my, uh, the other observers, and uh, after the telescope closed, we would uh, sail on the lake and uh, do other stuff and try to buy a really bad, cheap wine at Safeway, even though we were both <laughs> underage. Um, after I went to, uh, to Caltech, and I did a postdoc in the uh, University of Cambridge in England, spent, uh, was a residence research associate uh, briefly at Marshall Space Flight Center, and then I came to the National Solar Observatory where I met uh, Claude and Teresa, and we worked together for, for some years up at the McMath Solar Telescope. When uh, Claude finally couldn't stand me anymore, Teresa was more polite, I uh, lit off the Goddard Space Flight Center where I've been since. So if we go to the first uh, uh, well, first on the title slide, you got that up? Yep, it's up. Um, what you're looking at there is a picture, uh, just just because it's so pretty, I uh, love to show it. It's uh, taken by another sort of amateur professional, Professor Druckmuller, who is uh, a professor of electrical engineering, but uh, has made a more than a hobby out of taking some of the most beautiful eclipse pictures ever. Uh, and uh, that is a picture of the eclipse and what you see, uh, with of course the sun obscured by the, the moon. Is that the 06 uh, eclipse? I believe it is, in Libya. Uh, and what you see is that clearly the solar corona, which you're seeing there, from light scattered off free electrons uh, that are around the sun is highly structured. And we're going to explore 
how highly structured and how a photon sieve, which although I never expect to, uh, it to supplant the sieve uh, that strains spaghetti, uh, does have maybe a role to play. So the, the next slide. Uh, since we're talking about milli arc second resolution, uh, what is that? Well, there are uh, a lot of zeros there. That's six zeros. One milli arc second is about 0 0.3 millionths of a degree. The sun is about half a degree across. So that's not much. And in fact, it's uh, about the size of the LA metropolitan area at the distance of the sun, 93 million miles. Uh, but it's also eight astronomical units, or eight distances between the sun and the earth, all the way at the center of the galaxy. And so you're beginning with that kind of angular resolution to be able to see things at the scale of planetary systems at the center of the galaxy. So that's a milli arc second small angle measure. Who cares? Uh, it's that there really are a number of the phenomena that we either know directly or suspect very strongly. Uh, only sub 10 of these very tiny angles I see from Earth. So in the next slide, uh, you see three, uh, three illustrations. Uh, I, I will come back to the one in the upper left, which is uh, structure on the sun. We'll have much more to say about that. Uh, in the center is an artist's conception. See, it's always an artist's conception, but maybe not for her. Uh, an X-ray binary system there. You have a, a, you know, a late type star, an accretion disk around a, a neutron star, creating an X-ray binary. Uh, again, even nearby ones are very tiny as seen from Earth, those systems. And finally, everybody would love to resolve the uh, immediate environs of uh, black holes, uh, supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies. Uh, but they are even in, uh, in our own galaxy, uh, the central black hole is, uh, you don't see the black hole itself, but even its environment is much too small to see with the angular resolution we have. So there are a number of aspects problems and then you'll see at the near the end of the talk that there is the uh, photon sieve kind of technology uh, is known uh, in theory and that there are people interested in this kind of extreme milli arc second resolution. So on the next slide we'll say why uh, but today we'll, we'll talk mainly about the application of this to the sun why because Although I started out as an extragalactic uh, astronomer, I'm a solar physicist, and I think that this kind of extreme imaging, it may be the key to understanding the solar corona, which uh, could be unfortunate for some of us since it's like job security <laughs> for so long. But I, since I'm Maybe nearing, you know, the, certainly the, the downslope of my career. Now I want to solve it. Because we have employment for future generations. Does that mean your funding's running out? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's funding, there's funding at work and there's funding at home. And so we'll have to discuss that offline. But no, no, not <laughs> Anyway, I think the sun, the sun is also uh, nice, and, uh, nice and bright, and so it's an attractive near-term target. So in the next slide, and we're not going to, I'm not going to ply you with a whole bunch of graphs, um, but this one sort of sets up uh, much that is to come. And what you're looking at in this graph is uh, either temperature or density, but let's focus on temperature on the, on the left-hand axis, a logarithmic scale and height uh, going on the x-axis toward the right. And what I want you to look at is where you see the words photosphere, temperature minimum, chromosphere, and then you see what looks like a vertical wall <laughs> and then something that heads up to that region called corona. 
That's the big mystery of the solar atmosphere, that the surface is less than 6,000 degrees Kelvin. Um, roughly speaking, 6,000 degrees uh, centigrade. Uh, the corona is more than, typically more than a million degrees. And you know, simple, simple balls of gas don't act that way. The temperature doesn't increase as you go outward. Uh, we've known for a long time that it does. And we still don't know. We think we have to know why it's all tied up with the magnetic fields that give the, as you'll see in the pictures, the intricate structure of the outer atmosphere of the sun. So I don't think we have very much doubt about that. But not having doubt is not quite the same as proving it and seeing it. And part of the reason it's difficult to pin down is because we think the on which physical processes operate are so small. So let me not, and the other thing that happens when you go toward the right in that diagram, the temperature goes up to a million degrees, and then the density of the gas goes way down. In fact, once, uh, and, and falls exponentially as you go outward from the sun. So the corona is a thin thing. It's a thin, it's hot, and it's a thin, yeah, uh, we can see right through it. Let's look at the next slide. And this, I'm hoping, uh, shows a cross drone running. It's running. And why do I show this? Because I can. <laughs> uh, so solar physicists get to show videos where if you're a time domain astronomer, the time domain is uh, is a year or 10 years or 100 years or 1,000 years, and we can take movies, so it's cool. Yeah. That's, that was from the Hinode Japanese US uh, spacecraft, still, still operational, uh, although not this particular instrument. Uh, and it shows gas projecting. This is not coronal temperature gas, but it's a prominence uh, and it just shows how complex the structure is and ever-changing the structure is, and it's pretty. If you go to the next slide, you okay. see another completely different scale. This is from the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory, launched a long time ago, still in orbit, still working. Uh, and what you're looking at is a coronal mass ejection. Uh, I'm sure almost all of you have heard of it. Uh, does terrible things to people on uh, in, in TV movies. Uh, <laughs> it, can, it can do reasonably bad things to uh, satellites and has, and even uh, terrestrial power systems on occasion. Uh, this is a much bigger scale. The sun, all of the sun, is inside that little uh, that little thing, that little circle at the center. So we've stepped back and showed these huge scale and powerful uh, eruptions from the sun. And finally, in the next slide, there we go. You should be seeing that's the one that says Stereo A. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Uh -huh. that's, that's a stereo spacecraft. And as you go from right to left, it pieces together a number of instruments. It's a, quite a feat of technology, as well as data processing, uh, that traces solar wind from the sun all the way to the earth. So the corona, which is what we're talking about studying, in one way or another, actually reaches out and almost envelops the earth. And that solar wind flows out. In the past, it has been so terribly faint, you couldn't see it, but now we can. And we can even trace it from the sun all the way out. So the corona is uh, is a beautiful and essential part of the sun and what makes it interesting. Okay, in the next slide, we ask how do we see the corona? Well, you saw in the very first slide, and those of you who were, uh, and I imagine there are uh, a number in your astronomical society who did go to see the total solar eclipse last year, and there you go. And you saw the corona. So yeah, you can see the corona with your eyes. 
and that comes from the... But that's not light that's produced by the solar corona, by that hot gas. That is light that comes off the bright disk of the sun and scatters off electrons uh, in the gas around the sun. What we're going to see, uh, uh, mainly concentrated on, on, is light that comes from the itself. And the reason for that is you can learn a lot about it by studying light it actually emits. So how do we see the corona? The answer is you can see it over the total electromagnetic spectrum, but these uh, what we will call extreme ultraviolet and soft X-ray wavelengths are particularly valuable because they really probe the gas itself. And that's just a consequence, as you're familiar with it, with atomic physics and atomic energy levels. If you have gas at a million degrees, a lot of the things like iron is ionized maybe 10, 12, 14 times, and the energy levels that are left when they make, when electrons jump from one energy level to the other, tend to emit in the extreme ultraviolet wavelengths. So let's, what do we see when that happens? That's in the next slide. And that's uh, two pictures from the, uh, from the Solar Dynamics Observatory. It's a NASA mission, launched in 2000, nine, I believe, and is still up and working. Uh, and in fact, it observes uh, the sun 24-7 in a, a number of ultra, extreme ultraviolet wavelengths, uh, as well as some longer wavelengths. <clears throat> the reason I show you this is one, it is another pretty picture, but it's a pretty picture with quantitative information. The false color, and it is false color, of course, the, the, this is light far too short for our eyes to see. But that false color represents different stages of ionization of iron and tells us something about the temperature and the density and other things across the different regions. That's why they have different colors. If all the gas was the same, it would be some uniform smudged out color. But the biggest contrast is between that main image and that little inset image in the upper left, which is, uh, this is, uh, was a recent picture from SDO, but not in the extreme ultraviolet, in a sort of an ultraviolet uh, wavelength that doesn't have spectral lines in it. And what's remarkable about it is that's the other face of the sun. There's nothing there. Now, it's interesting still to solar physicists, but when you look at the sun at most wavelengths, you might see sunspots, you might see a few things, but you can often see a rather featureless disk. That's what visible light shows you of the sun. And it's not inhomogeneous, right? It's kind of a flat disk. Whereas in the extreme ultraviolet, you always see this extreme structure, and it never stands still. Now you're looking at the whole solar disk there. In the next slide, we ask the question, repeat the question from the previous slide, is there even fine scale structure? Well, what do you know? There is. Uh, and the, the images here on the left uh, from the high C sounding rocket are the state of the art. And the number to take away is 250 to 300 milli arc seconds. So for those of you who uh, are, uh, have your amateur telescopes, you know that uh, you can probably read each other in a good night. Uh, better than one arc second scene. This is maybe a quarter to a third uh, in the And I won't, I won't dwell on this too long, except if you look at the uh, over to the left of that uh, of that diagram, uh, you can see some like 
one second from the bottom, a small image second from the bottom, that appears to show things twisted around each other, braiding of gas from one place to the other. And that's very interesting to us because we believe that some of the heat from the corona may be generated from the braiding of magnetic fields, which then become unhappy with each other and express their unhappiness by changing their magnetic configuration and releasing energy. Because we always want to know, why is the corona hot? It's annoying to us that it's hot when it shouldn't be. <laughs> so this, uh, this emission comes from uh, 11 times ionized iron, iron 12. It has a wavelength of 19.3 nanometers. That's 193 angstroms. So for those of you who are not visible lights, your uh, is, uh, is uh, 5,000 odd angstroms, green light. This is way down there at 193 angstroms, way below even the ultraviolet. So now we want to know, is there even, excuse me, finer scale structure? When do we ever stop with this? Well, before we get there, this, this uh, image taken by high C was from something called a sounding rocket, which instead of the big marvelous uh, Falcon 9 and everything that we love to watch, uh, and it's particularly exciting for old folks like me because that's how we felt rockets should land when I was seven years old. But then I learned yeah, they do. Of course, they never land like that. In fact, they don't land at all. Now, they So I'm happy. A sounding rocket, uh, many of which launched from the White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. Should I be on the next slide by now? Uh, not yet. Okay. Uh, 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 launch on these sounding rockets, which are suborbital rockets. They never reach orbit. Uh, they only are up there for about less than 20 minutes. <clears throat> and typically, uh, if you go high enough so that you can see extreme ultraviolet radiation, which, good for us, does not penetrate the atmosphere and irradiate us, which would be bad for our health. Yeah. You only get about six minutes of data, yet these high, uh, IC data were very important and uh, got the cover of, of magazines. In the next slide, I have to promote our own sounding rocket, which uh, Claude mentioned. We call it Eunice, and uh, uh, there it is on the left. Taking off, that is not a generic rocket. That was the uh, launch of Eunice. It's flown successfully three times. And uh, we're very proud of the data. It is different from what you'll talk about, the fo what we're going to talk about. Uh, Photon CIF produces very high resolution images. We don't produce terribly high resolution images, a couple of arc seconds in Eunice. <clears throat> but if you look, Above the image on the right, you'll see a whole bunch of, uh-oh, are they stalagmites? Don't yes. They are. Yes. If they go the off. The consensus is yes. Stalagmites. Stalagmites, yeah. Yeah. M's so, yeah. So those are you stand. Yeah. hundreds. Good. Uh, they're, uh, those are hundreds of spectral lines in the extreme ultraviolet. So it is a spectrograph, and I'm sure almost all of you know what that is, a very high resolution spectrograph uh, for a sounding rocket in space. So it's different from the, from the kind of what the photon SID is aiming for. But to our, our surprise, we were named in what, 2015 as one of the 100 top stories in Discover Science for 2015. And what I found interesting, you'll see it there, a hot answer to a solar mystery, is, uh, and that the person in the picture is identified as me, uh, you can always hide behind those masks in the clean room, but is in fact much more handsome than me and younger. That's Adrian. Adrian Ah, who is uh, also part of this work and is now the principal investigator. Uh, but we were number 14, one behind, one step closer to a universal flu vaccine. You! <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
We thought, yeah, you know, we love Eunice, but I really don't see us being one behind a universal flu vaccine. I think maybe their priorities weren't quite in order. Okay, next slide. So this is uh, mostly the last diagram, and what I really want you to take away from it uh, you've got on the, uh, on the left-hand side the feature size in arc seconds, not milli arc seconds in this case. So way up the top is 10 arc seconds, 1 arc second, 0 0.1, 0 hundredth, thousandth, those thousandths, that's down to the milli arc second. On the other scale is the wavelength of observation. And the thing to notice, two things. One, where we think from physics, from the physics that we think we at least reasonably understand about how magnetic fields can restructure magnetic reconnection and how they can carry waves, how thin waves, and we have other kinds of waves. These are ways that the magnetic field has to transport energy and we think can carry energy from the surface of the sun up into the corona and make it hot. Right? But it operates, it happens on very fine spatial scales. And you see down there the thing called classical dissipation scale, collisionless dissipation scale. <clears throat> we don't worry about the details of that, but I point out that it begins at 10 milli arc seconds and goes down from there. If you're not beginning to approach 10, 20, 30 milli arc seconds, you're not where the action, we think the action is going to be. And all the spacecraft, which you see identified, NASA loves acronyms. And uh, many of them, by the way, are not acronyms. SDO is not an acronym. CDS, SPICE, that's an acronym. But all those missions, they do, they have, do and have done great work but they're way up there at one arc second. You can see high C is a little triangle sort of in the, in the middle of there. That's the state of the art. We need to get down toward the bottom of the graph, and it's how do we do that? Uh, there are also, besides, just to go back to broader astrophysics, you can see some... Um, some, a couple of diameters there, like the uh, diameter of Alpha Centauri and the extent of its corona. So if you can get down to these uh, few milli arc second scales, you can also actually resolve only some space, of course, because you can't have the atmosphere in the way. You could actually resolve uh, some supergiant stars <clears throat> and uh, uh, observe their coronas directly. Hmm. You might ask, could you observe exoplanet systems? We'll come back to that, but not in the EUV, because exoplanets uh, don't emit any extreme ultraviolet. But it depends their parents on what wars they have. Pardon? It just depends on if they're at war or not. <laughs> yeah. They, they, could, they could for a brief and shining moment. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so in the next slide, What we show is uh, nano flares and to make a weak one, a hot topic. So <laughs> the idea here is, is to give you a flavor <clears throat> of how we think how we think we might be able to see these structures and reveal them with this ultra high angular resolution. So around the left, you have an image <clears throat> of the kind you've seen before. An extreme ultraviolet image showing all these lovely loops and things twisting around. And if you see a movie, they're always they're always reconfiguring and waving and doing all sorts of stuff. And a tiny little box there, expanded out to a to a, a microscopic field of view, showing pixels with various angular resolution. Now this is a simulation. It's a physics-based simulation, but it, it is not an observation. <clears throat> and what you see is that at 0.2 arc seconds, 200 milli arc seconds, I don't see anything. At 100 milli arc seconds, 
Yeah, you may get a, an inkling there that you have some kind of linear structures, uh, which is how inter, inter uh, twining magnetic fields that are generally aligned that kind of brush and scrape up against each other can set off little reconnection areas and light up in a, like, a portion of a linear <coughs> arrangement. Um, if you go to 0 0.03 arc seconds, 30 milli arc seconds, then you begin to see this. In fact, you see rather well this arrangement of straws, if you will, which are expected to be flickering on and off because of this so-called nanoflare activity. And finally, if you go down to 10 milli arc seconds, which is kind of where the simulation put them in the first place, <coughs> then it's obvious. <coughs> but the indications are, if you get to <coughs> That where we need to be to start approaching the scales, we don't have to get quite to one milli arc second all at once. We need to get down to the uh, tens of milli arc seconds, and we have the chance of seeing these structures. Okay, so next slide. Now we get toward the photon signal, this elaborate introduction, but it's necessary to understand why you do such a silly thing as we're about to describe. <laughs> Because what do you do when you want to see something uh, <clears throat> that's smaller and far away? Well, you build a bigger telescope. Now, I think you all know as uh, amateur astronomers that the uh, atmosphere gets in the way of that on Earth. You can't just build a bigger telescope and get more and more angular resolution. But in principle, you can do that in space. <clears throat> There's no atmosphere to get in the way. And uh, many of you, uh, and most of your colleagues, are familiar with the best you can expect from your whatever size your, your telescope might be. Uh, it's so-called diffraction limit, uh, which is uh, from physics. 1.22 lambda over the diameter. And if you have one micron radiation, that's like near infrared radiation in a one meter telescope, you get 252 milli arc seconds. So take the wavelength down. If instead of one net, uh, micron, it's one thousandth of a micron, that's a nanometer, then you're down to hey, that's great, less than a milli arc second. Or that's for a one meter telescope. Or take it some way, other wavelength and, and make it two meters. Whatever you have to do, right? So what's the problem? The problem is not a single problem. One is that uh, lenses made out of most materials you can think of uh, don't transmit extreme ultraviolet light. And I mean, not weekly, zero for all practical purposes. You just can't make lens-based telescopes and see extreme ultraviolet light. But worse than that, mirrors. Ordinary mirrors, the kind of telescope mirrors, parabolic shape or some more complicated shape that, uh, that many of you have, they don't work either. They don't uh, reflect extreme ultraviolet light. There are special uh, mirrors called multi, multi-layer mirrors that do reflect, and I don't have time to go into the technology, the thin film technology that allows them to do this, but they still don't work either in terms of just building a bigger telescope and getting ultimate angular resolution to why not. Uh, uh, an SDO, the Solar Dynamics Observatory, is a, is a perfect example of that. <coughs> it has a 200 millimeter, 20 centimeter aperture. It should produce an angular resolution according to the formula there of 24 milli arc seconds at 19 nanometers 
one of the uh, ionized iron lines, but its resolution isn't even close. Why? Because as many of you also know, and those of you who have made a telescope mirror, telescope mirrors have to be darn accurate. They ought to be lambda over 8 and lambda over 10. You can see all that in uh, magazines uh, advertising telescopes. And uh, that is true. The problem is that if lambda is uh, 20 nanometers and not 500 nanometers, then lambda over 10 is one darn small number. In fact, it's two nanometers, which means all the little ripples, and you have a nice parabola, but it's a little bit ripply. Well, those ripples have to be so small, two nanometers. And the answer is, it's possible to do very small optics like that at very great expense. And there are places in the dark world, shall we say, where that kind of money can be spent. Uh, but not, not by most astronomers. And if you go to a substantial, let's say, one meter class optics, I'm not sure that that, that can be done at all. So we need a different approach in the next slide. Let's step back and just remind ourselves how a lens works. So this is just an animated GIF, so that it should be going fine, right, Claude? Yeah, yeah, that's working fine. And you see a uh, a representation of a of a light wave. It's can be all these parallel lines that re represents an infinitely distant point source. Nice, a nice flat wave front. It's a wave front because light behaves like a wave. And so you see the peaks and troughs. It goes through the lens, and the thicker parts of the lens, inside the thicker parts of the lens, light travels more slowly, and it causes, inside any part of the lens, light travels more slowly. The longer it spends in the lens, which means in, in the center where it's thicker, <clears throat> the wafer it lags more. The ones near the edge don't have to spend so much time in the glass there, and they go through, and the result is a flat wavefront turns into this curved wavefront, which then can converge to a focus. Good. That's all fine. But we know that we can't use lenses. This is just to remind ourselves about light and wavefront, some things that you've almost certainly seen before and familiar with. Okay. Next slide. It is Diffraction. Good. Say again, Claude? And it is, it is animated. Mm -hmm. so. Good. That's one. Yeah, animated GIFs mm -hmm. rarely fail. They're not like, because uh, they don't rely on PowerPoint to behave in any sense. <laughs> uh, why it work? Uh, so, diffraction is uh, a natural consequence of the, the wave nature of light again. And here you see that same kind of uniform wavefront coming in from the left of the screen. You have to imagine we're looking sideways at two narrow slits, like spectrograph slits. Uh, if light behaved like light rays, geometrical optics, which is what you know, people, uh, you use your ray tracing program and you figure out how your telescope were or if that were the way things really worked on time, then you would get to, it would project two sharp images of that slit. But what you actually see, if this slit is narrow and approaches the wavelength of the light, it is that you get places that are behind a brick wall, essentially. There shouldn't be any light there, but there it is. It's fainter, but it's there, and light can bend around corners. And you can see this, uh, you can see this with water waste at uh, obstacles at the beach. Things can get, a, light can get around corners. Well, that, you might say, that that's not a good thing. That just makes forming an image worse. And usually uh, that's true, but not always. 
on the right of that slide, I just want to remind everybody, and many of you are familiar with this too, because you look telescope and you want your telescope to be nearly diffraction limited, you know that there is a, 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 a limit on how well you can make an image. This limit is very basic physics in the sense that you, it is extremely difficult to get around it. Um, so, uh, so if you have something very, very far away that can be considered essentially a point of infinity, a star really, really far away, and you take a perfect, truly perfect 18-inch uh, uh, telescope, it still doesn't focus the light to a point. It must have a finite size. It's given by that formula that we saw before, and not only that, it has a characteristic pattern, which is a bright central core, the brightest little spike, that's the, think of as the image, but it's surrounded by these uh, much weaker rings. And these are called the airy rings, after dead airy, who uh, I don't think discovered them, but first properly described. Um, so, in any case, just like over on the left, where you see light beam where it shouldn't be, there's light beam where it shouldn't be in that image. But I want you to kind of remember those airy rings because you're going to see them later. Next slide. So, the, uh, the basis of how this is going to work was found by a, uh, our somewhat dour friend over there on the left, <laughs> Fresnel. Uh, a French physicist, and he found a way. And I'm not, even though the the reason the diagram is there, and even the formulas, is to communicate that the uh, the, the basic arguments behind these um, Fresnel's own plates and a photon sieve is going to turn out to be kind of a variation of that is really very simple. It's kind of like it's just algebra. And what a Fresnel zone plate is, is think of something that has a, uh, a, there's a bullseye, and let's say that bullseye blocks light. And there's a ring around that that lets light through. And then there's a ring around that that blocks it again, and there's one that's transparent, open, and so on. You'll notice, however, they aren't equally spaced. And the simple uh, algebra is what Fresnel's insight was, is that if I have a Fresnel zone plate here, and in comes some light this way, and I'm sitting here, then there's a pathway from here to here. Now, what you want to bring light to a focus is that everything have the same pathway or, or differ from this direct path by an integral number of wavelengths. So if you think of wavelengths of light, every wavelength is the same. So if you can add an extra wavelength, it's all good. It'll still focus. If you add half a wavelength, it's all bad. It destructively interferes, and that produces those things in the last slide where you don't get light. If you want to add up these beams that are going through different parts of this zone plate, you just want the zones to be distributed so that the center of each transmitting zone, you add one wavelength of light. So this is right through the center, that's one distance, right through the center of the next zone adds one wavelength, right through the center of the next one adds two wavelengths. They interfere constructively, whereas the bad parts where they interfere destructively are blocked. So it's really very simple. Keep the good stuff that's going to contribute to bringing to a focus and block the bad stuff. That's a Fresnel zone plate. 
Why don't you use it all the time? By the way, it's not the same thing as a Fresnel lens. Most of you are familiar with those. They are more like refracted lenses. The zone plate is a different thing. It operates by diffraction. So the, the algebra is simple. The concept is simple. Why don't you use them all the time? We'll get back into that. But, you know, the biggest thing is they're not terribly darn efficient. You're not nearly as efficient as a computer. So you, 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 there's no reason, very little reason to use these things. You can, by the way, you've taken an image from the sun from the ground with a Fresnel zone plate and a photon sieve. There are also reasons to use them in physical wavelengths because you could make them on a, maybe on a piece of mylar and get to some, a 10 meter diameter telescope. <clears throat> so. It turns out there are people interested in this, even at this point. <clears throat> Here's the key thing about the Fresnel zone plate. If you look at it, it's flat. It doesn't have, right? You're not trying to create some parabola or more elaborate figure. It's flat. Not only that, it doesn't have to be very flat. And that's a huge thing. Remember our problem? <clears throat> Mirrors would have to be flat to a tenth of a wavelength or better. You can take a Fresnel zone plate and you can kind of have it be bent or concave or a little convex by tens of wavelengths, not a tenth, tens, maybe even a hundred wavelengths. And it still works. Its performance degrades very little. So that is a key feature of why these things are useful. In the next slide, and I'm watching the time clock, we'll accelerate at a GDP. <clears throat> so, but what we were on the left there is this Fresnel zone plate. Uh, now we remember that almost uh, no material transmits EUV light. So look, look at those at the bright. These are the open zones, right? Well, imagine trying to pick that up. What's holding it together? The, the dark parts <laughs> are something actual. And there are a bunch of rings that aren't connected to each other. <coughs> this does not bode well. That's just an engineering problem. <laughs> That's wrong. <laughs> so, the first approximation, the open zones have to be really open in the extreme ultraviolet vacuum. So what if you took each of those um, open zones where you have this open ring, white ring, and you replaced it? by a ring that's still closed. In other words, it's real physical material, but it has holes in it. You're going to put thousands, in fact, often millions of little holes distributed around each ring, where a hole is about the diameter, is about the width of the ring. So you have a big hole in the center, and then your holes become smaller and smaller and smaller. You get over on the right, finally, the photon sieve. It's a simple concept, but to my knowledge, it wasn't. It was only proposed for the first time in 1992 for doing, uh, for making uh, X-ray measurements in synchrotron. I believe these zone plates uh, and now photon sieves are often used in uh, <clears throat> medical research and uh, other scientific research at synchrotron sources. So, photon sieve, you have an open zone, instead you have many, many, many holes. Uh, so it's a solid piece of material with a bunch of holes in it, it holds together on its own. You can play around with the arrangement of the holes, should they be systematic, should they be random, should be this, that, they have to be in the zones. But as far as how they distribute around the zones and respect to each other, you can play all sorts of games. Doesn't make a huge difference, frankly. It works pretty much like a Fresnel zone play. 
But for this extreme ultraviolet energy, where this is a real hole, so light goes right through, uh, it turns out to have the kind of uh, uh, diameter we need and enough, and enough zones to give the resolution we need, you need millions of holes, and the smallest holes are very small. In our, in our best, uh, only two microns, two millionths of a meter. <laughs> so there is no drill in your, in your drill set, in your bit set, that will drill holes that small. <clears throat> in fact, it uh, turns out it's not even easy to do it with a laser. So how do we do it? Next slide. Now here we're finally getting to something that we've done, which is producing lots of tiny holes by lithography. Uh, lithography, for those of you who know anything about it, uh, comes in many flavors. Uh, it's used to produce printed circuit boards, it creates, uh, but it also comes in more exotic flavors like electron beam lithography, which can make extremely small features, nanometers in size, and it's used in a lot of wonderful exotic materials nowadays. <clears throat> but things that are made by electron beam lithography tend to be this big. <laughs> we need things that are going to be this big and eventually this big like real telescopes, by golly. So we use photolithography, a particularly uh, somewhat exotic variant of it called deep reactive ion etching. And here's where our lithography expert, Kevin, <coughs> combined science and art, kind of comes up with magic to get what you see in, that, in those diagrams. First on the left, uh, you see an 80 millimeter diameter photon sieve. To my knowledge, this might be the largest photon sieve that's ever been made uh, with these kind of small holes in it. <clears throat> and you see, well, all you see is a circle there, right? A kind of a gray smudged out circle because the holes are all too small to see, except maybe if the screen is good enough, you can see see the very central hole or something. The isotope is a micrograph, picture taken with a microscope, that shows still sort of the inner part where there you have these holes are a few, 10 microns or so. In our so far <clears throat> smallest features over on the right, you have something that has features as small as two microns across. And that turned out to be our goal. We don't have to go much smaller than that. That's what we need. We're going to try to make bigger diameters, but we don't need to make smaller holes. You might all notice that the ones on the right are not holes. Well, they're sort of holes, but they're elongated. They're slots. And the answer is, yeah, you're right. And that emphasizes how similar that uh, a photon sieve and the Fresnel's oak light are very close cousins. You can elongate holes into these arc-shaped slots, and it still behaves like it's both structurally connected and it acts more has more area like a zone plate. Why do you do that? Because you want the most open area you can get. You want all the photons you can possibly get to get through. Right? If you have a big telescope, you buy it just like if you got a big telescope and, and uh, blah, too much from getting into it or have a secondary mirror that's too big, then you can't see faint objects. <laughs> so we need efficiency as well. Uh, and finally, look at the bottom there. I don't know why we're proud of this, but uh, we believe we are uh, 52,352,407 slots. Excuse me, Don. You betcha. Yes. Uh, when you, particularly when you get to the elongated slots, as you call them, the separation between the slots starts looking a bit like uh, a projection of a, a telescope spider down onto the pupil. 
Do you have to worry about uh, these things creating diffraction themselves? And so is that somewhat why a lot of these are offset from one another, the different, uh, the different Fresnel zones in there? Yep. Oh. <laughs> you got it exactly. There's no, there's no free lunch. Right? What? It's true. Because you can take an ordinary, simple Fresnel zone light and just put spider connections in it. It can be dark. Uh, if they're too systematic, then you will create systematic diffraction patterns at the focal plane. Because this is the pupil and you put it. You still get you still get a nearly diffraction limited core, which is very important for the sun. But when you're trying to interpret an image <clears throat> that is continuous, like on the sun, you want a relatively simple diffraction pattern. With a star, as you see in a lot of, you know, looking sky telescope, any star from a big telescope, you see the diffraction spikes. But you know that's what they are. On the other hand, if there's a if there's a debris disk around that star, or if in the sun you have a continuous scene and not a point of light, you don't want everything to kind of get confused with each other because of extended diffractions patterns that are avoidable. So you're absolutely right. Um, so in the next slide, I just want you to know that uh, these things work. <clears throat> Over on the left, you have this uh, rather attractive uh, thing that looks like a, like a spider from hell. <laughs> What's inside that mount is an 80 millimeter photon sip that we made at Goddard. <clears throat> uh, the exotic pattern you see, <coughs> I'm sorry. Somewhat exotic pattern there is what it looks way off axis and it gets all very complicated, but it's pretty. The important thing is what it looks like on the optical axis. That's in the center. And you see, hey, hey Nani, that's a an airy pattern. That's a classical diffraction pattern. And in the inset, it actually compares quantitatively that airy pattern to what you expect from a they are not up too darn far apart. You see, as these are supposed to do. On the right is a picture of one of our photon sieves being uh, on a vibration table. So one of the things you don't have to do with your telescope on the ground is vibrate the lift machines out of it. But you do for anything that you propose to send into space. So these, our photon sieves, right, are only 15 to 25 microns thick, right? That's something that's really, really thin. Thinner than, you know, a piece of saran wrap that you've got in the, uh, or cling wrap you've got in the kitchen. So, yet, if you want it to survive being sent on a booster in space, you've got to put it on one of these tables and, and shake, shake, shake. We did it, and uh, it's, what is the substrate? We have items. It's broken. Say again, please. Oh, what is the substrate? What is the substrate? Uh oh. Uh oh. Is uh, what froze now? Uh, we, you did. Your uh, your audio and video froze for a moment there. So could you repeat that? The substrate, in our case, is single crystal silicon. So oh, it's the same. It, it is uh, wafers that you would uh, that you would also buy uh, in the uh, that would uh, be used to make integrated circuits. 
There are other materials that can be used, like silicon nitride, uh, but this is not ordinary glass. That doesn't that doesn't work with the uh, the etching that you have to use mm -hmm. in the photolithography process. So at this point, we would at least know that the photon sieve has a has it has a purpose. <clears throat> it's in some ways a simple thing. The mathematics of it can become quite complicated when you want to understand everything you want. You have to understand about it to design an instrument. But that shouldn't get in the way of, in the sense, you <clears throat> just from what you've seen, you've already grasped the essence of these things. <clears throat> like many ideas, they have a core of simplicity. And that's, that's a good thing, especially for someone like me. Uh, in the next slide, just to remind you that there are there are folks. Uh, I identified the people who were on the first page as having contributed to this work. There are some others as well. Uh, in particular, over on the right, Kevin is our is our lithography genius. The idiot on the left, I have no idea. Uh, Joe Davila, in the bottom right, uh, was one of the first people to. Uh, to draw our attention to the uh, interesting uh, possibilities you can have with these photons. Tom there is our vibration gas monitor in Greenbelt, Maryland, which is just outside the hated beltway. Uh, we go inside the beltway as rarely as we possibly can. Uh, Whereas uh, Tom is at Wallops Flight Facility, its own place down in Virginia, a very scenic place, where they launch uh, big stuff into orbit sometimes. Now, I won't we'll talk about the contribution that Farzad uh, makes. He's a professor of electrical engineering at the University of Illinois. Uh, but it's, I will at least tell you that you can do more with a photon sieve than just take an image. If you have sharp spectral lines that are near to each other in wavelength, and you image them with a photon sieve, you get something that is at the same time bad, because it kind of produces a sharp image with one spectral line and a slightly fuzzy image in another, and they're on top of each other. Or if you're an optimist or you're Farzad, you say this is this is a feature, not a bug, because <laughs> I can use the fact that one's out of, a little out of focus and one's in better focus. I can go through a couple of several focal positions, and I can get both of them out of it. It's a uh, complicated deconvolution process that, in fact, we were funded, uh, and Farzad primarily was funded just a couple months ago to start working on. So we're excited about that. Next slide. <clears throat> this will go by fast, because if you haven't asked, and I bet some of you have been asking, hey, where's the extreme ultraviolet image? Because what I showed you from the laboratory was, a bit, uh, was an image taken in visible light from the helium-neon laser. It's supposed to work in the EUV, that's the whole point. The answer is, next slide. We're working on it. <laughs> now, uh, I just always say this, but I'll say it too. We have little doubt it's all going to work out as planned, partly because these things are so darn simple. We started by testing them in the laboratory of visible wavelengths because that's the easiest thing to do. Testing at extreme ultraviolet wavelengths, we're now pretty close to being able to, uh, to start that testing. But as you can see from that setup, and I'm not going to go through it, it's a lot more uh, messy and complicated. Why? Because everything has to be vacuum, and you have to have uh, special things that can transmit the EUV, and you have to produce an extreme ultraviolet, because we, we can't look at the sun. The EUV from the sun doesn't get through the atmosphere, so we need an extreme ultraviolet source. You produce that with 
a cathode discharge, blah, 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 and it's all, it's all in some ways fairly standard stuff, <clears throat> but it takes a lot of the work. It is, however, if you were thinking it, you're right, it's an essential step, and we know how to demonstrate this in order to prove that you can uh, use these things in space. Okay, in the next slide, and we're coming toward the end. Um, I won't spend time on this. There's only one thing. That these formulas are, are there primarily to show you that the basic formulas uh, that, that you do in designing uh, uh, a photon state imaging system are, are simple. And that uh, they're as simple as, and in some cases, more simple than the kind of optics many of you have already mastered to you know, kind of work with your own telescopes. <coughs> But one thing I do want to draw your attention to is focal length. There's a formula there, F equals D delta over lambda. D is the, F is the focal length of the telescope. D is the diameter of the telescope. Delta is the size of the smallest hole, the outermost holes in the photon snap. Hmm. And lambda is the wavelength. Now, if you make the diameter bigger, the focal length goes up. If you can make holes that are even smaller, the focal length goes down. But the key thing is that the wavelength goes down, it's in the denominator, the focal length goes up. If you plug in numbers and put D of 80 millimeters, the one we have now, or point, uh, or 200 millimeters, which we'll have shortly, and you put delta 2 microns, you get long, 50 meters. These things have long focal lengths. And you can't play tricks like you do with a telescope. The telescopes we're familiar with, you can't have another mirror, can't have a mirror at all, can't have a secondary, you can't do this, you can't do that to make it nice and compact. <laughs> it's not catadioptric, it's nothing, it's dead simple. So what do you, you do, do next slide? You've got to create a virtual telescope in space. A virtual telescope that has where your telescope is going to be uh, 50, 100 meters long, uh, or even uh, 1,000 meters, or even 10,000 meters long at X-ray wavelengths. And yes, people very much have thought of that. And in fact, so much a uh, fairly substantial mission called Proba 3 that the European Space Agency is building uh, it was supposed to have launched by now, so as the usual thing in the space trade, kind of like uh, computer programming, it'll be ready real soon now. <laughs> These two spacecraft will create a solar corona of 150 meters long. See, you can see in the over to the left there, there is the set camera. Now, this is not a photon suit. It's not even a telescope in the, uh, in the ordinary sense. This is like a tiny uh, Earth-Moon system. What's out there blocking out the sun at the right-hand side of that picture is just an opaque disk. It's acting like the moon passing in front of the sun and creating a coronagraph. Mm -hmm. What we want to use is where that opaque disk is we're not going to block out the sun. We're going to put a photon sieve there and image the sun back onto the trailing spacecraft. That's probe three. And of course, in order, as you, those of you who have aligned your telescopes know, uh, well, these things can't flail around. They've got to be precisely aligned down to millimeters of separation and sub-millimeters and being lined up. It's another talk, and someone may talk to you about it someday, 
about how you do the formation flying of a spacecraft because a lot of interesting reason for doing it and it has a lot of technology micro thrusters and you need to do laser ranging and you need to do more exotic things than that it's all technology that is uh, within reach but hasn't been demonstrated yet Proba 3 is not yet launched uh, next slide now I'm not going to spend any time on this this is a recall for you that things that have extremely high angular resolution which is the vertical axis so as you go up and to the right you get more and more angular resolution, and you get more and more spacecraft separation until finally you get up to thousands of kilometers of separation and down truly to a milliard second or even smaller. Have people thought about it? Yes, they have. That's why there are, there are conceptual mission names associated with it there. So I won't go into it, but yes, astronomer are thinking about this technology. Uh, they proposed missions for it. Uh, it hasn't really been demonstrated to the satisfaction that you put a billion dollars behind it. We want to be the first ones to show that you can really do something by putting a modest kind of thing into the mission sun. So in the, what is the final slide, I believe, and then next to the final slide, uh, Proba 3, that thing that you just saw, well, it hasn't quite launched, but one of our team members, Nirav, who is on the far right of that uh, picture there, uh, unfortunately, where the photographer, the Goddard photographer, had to pose to be like either a, a bad firm of lawyers or <laughs> kind of, uh, uh, we're the we're not the TV doctors of America, we're the TV scientists of America, and we stand around in our lab coats. But Narav is a nice guy and a clever guy, and he's a, a partner in something called Canada X. It's a collaboration between the US and South Korea. It will demonstrate some of these aspects before Proba 3 uh, of using micro thrusters. In fact, the guy kneeling there is holding a bank of micro thrusters in his hands. The real CubeSat is in the lower right of the slide, so it's a real thing. And it's a good thing it's a real thing because it actually launched and deployed on the 11th of January. It's still in the uh, location and checkout phase, so I have no results to report from it. But uh, And it, it is not good enough to do it uh, to host a photon sieve, in addition to which it was done on a, a shoestring budget. But it's progress, and it's kind of our progress, so we're proud of it. All right, <laughs> this is the last slide. Where's the team headed? I told you before, uh, larger diameter. Uh, we are getting a new kind of, uh, of this reactive iron etching gear. It's cryogenic. It's all, all super fancy. Uh, Kevin is fighting about it. We're excited to immediately let us more than double the size of our diameter and think maybe we can see a path toward the uh, toward uh, already with the 180 millimeter diameter we can reach at the shortest wavelengths down at the 10 and even below milli arc second level so we can actually do some of the science exciting science that we were describing at the beginning. We don't have the money for a mission yet. That's the last thing. You always propose a mission after you have all your ducks in the room. At least that's what you do at NASA. <coughs> we demonstrated that they work, and we need to now demonstrate the work at extreme multiple wavelengths. Uh, we need to kind of simulate this virtual telescope, and on there you can actually see um, uh, doesn't look very much like a virtual telescope or two satellites, <laughs> but you have those strange spidery things there are called hexapods. They are extremely, they're able to six degree of freedom platforms that can move things in micron units. Mm -hmm. And you can simulate two spacecraft that are not perfectly controlled, but are actually, we are carrying out physically 
the metrology that determines whether where they are with respect to each other to a micron or better. Wow. Uh, so that we can show that the technology for flying these spacecraft in formation can be accomplished. So once we do that, we'll put a photon sieve on one of them, and we'll actually simulate a mission where you have know, two spacecraft trying their mightiest to keep exactly in alignment and do a pretty darn good job, good enough that you can actually image with a photon sieve on one of these uh, virtual satellites. That will be the basis for saying, you can believe us, this technology will work, and so you should ship us uh, several truckloads of money. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide, uh, that's just to say thank you, and we're grateful to, uh, to all the money folks at, uh, in, in some small way, uh, includes you, that we can do this kind of interesting but uh, um, uh, work that uh, some would say it's kind of crazy and why would you do such a thing? And I hope you've said that at least from the, uh, been able to convey that at least from the science point of view, uh, it's exciting and it's got some neat engineering in it too. Thank you very much. We have quite, do you have time for questions? Sure, absolutely. I apologize for going on. It's been 10 minutes over, so I apologize for that. A question, the 180 millimeter uh, uh, sieve, is that uses the same substrate? I didn't catch that, uh, as the 80 millimeter? Yes, it's still going to use uh, uh, larger wafers of single crystal silicon. Very good. Thank you. They are actually very specialized. They're called silicon on insulator sieves because uh, you know you can you can read up on it. It's uh, photolithography is kind of a mystifying process where you have to put down a photoresist and uh, on the silicon. But then what's left is going to be about 25 micron silicon. Uh, I'm we sorry. are currently looking. 25 microns. microns. Thank you. 25 microns, thick, all the way across. Hmm. And uh, you can shake it. And in fact, we'll shake it on that vibration table, and we think it will survive. But I can tell you, if you inadvertently touch it with your finger, mm. it's gone. Do you have to mm. worry about resonances on that? I mean, it's, it sounds like a drum head. Yeah. If you start shaking it, uh, can you set up a resonance and shatter it that way? Do you have to keep from playing opera around it? <laughs> <laughs> um, mm -hmm. The answer, of course, is uh, we, we, it does have the resonances of a drum head. Um, and what saves it, I mean, the reason is that actually, in some way, what saves it is that there is so little mass there. Right? So that when the acceleration of the vibration, which is uh, in sounding rockets, it's tested up to 30 Gs. Yes. So it's with hellish acceleration. But four forces mass times acceleration, and there's very little mass density there. That's the reason that these very light things can survive. But we will have, we would eventually have to do also what is called acoustic testing, where you put it in a chamber with hellishly loud music, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and make sure that you don't break it that way. You also have to put it in the thermal vacuum chamber and make sure you don't kill it that way. So there's still some stuff ahead of us. But people have flown in space, and many of you know this, what are called thin film filters, thin, very thin aluminum filters, much, much thinner than ours, and they have been flown in space in very thin films. You have to handle them extraordinarily carefully. You have to keep them in vacuum, but they can survive being launched on a rocket. Hmm. Other questions? Actually, I mean, 
You'll have to talk. One of the questions about. I had when uh, I first was reading about photon sieves. Could you speak loudly? Oh, yes. As, just as a uh, kind of amusing experiment would be uh, for an amateur, obviously not research grade, uh, could you literally print a, uh, a lens on a laser printer and make kind of a, a unique uh, telescope? You know, like an eight and a half by eleven. You are absolutely. No, you are. You are correct. And a great thought. It can be done, and it would be. Uh, it has been done. I haven't made one, uh, but uh, you can certainly. Man, I'm not sure it's been done with a uh, a um, with trying to do a photon sieve printed on a laser printer. But the uh, Fresnel zone plates have been done that way, and they will work at visible wavelengths. And it's one of the beauties of it, right? Because you can do it on a piece of uh, you know, transparency that you can do on your 600 or 1200 lines per inch laser printer. And because it's a zone plate and not a lens, it doesn't be flat. It can be this kind of crummy old. Acetate, right? So no, you're right. And I, uh, I think it would be fun. We should have we should have one of our summer students make up kind of pres prescription that people could uh, yeah <laughs> try out. Yeah, that'd be fun. I'll Thank know, you. I'll know what I'm doing with my laser printer tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are we are we still going to see you next month out here uh, from? Are you coming out to that uh, Lake Arrowhead meeting? You, you, you emailed something about that months ago. Yes, I will be coming out. We're going to be at the, uh, the UCLA Run Conference Center mm -hmm. uh, at Lake Arrowhead. Yeah, I can't well, yeah. And, uh, yeah, OK. Well, we're looking forward to seeing you out here. And uh, we are familiar with uh, hexapods. As a matter of fact, I think we have the same model PI hexapod. That's what our uh, number two mirror on the telescope here is mounted upon. So if you ever want to get rid of yes. those, uh, we could certainly use a spare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they're, and they're a bit pricey, aren't they? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I was yeah. down last year, and PI offered to uh, rent this one for 10K a month. <laughs> That's, that's nice of them. <laughs> Plus the exchange with. <laughs> yeah. Well, and as I'll, I'll leave you with this. I haven't been to Lake Arrowhead in a long time. <laughs> but this I know. My parents met at Lake Arrowhead when they were oh. 14 years old. <laughs> I have no idea where, but I'll ask my mother. And, uh, <laughs> If I can figure out where I became a twinkle in someone's eye, or, <laughs> and and, af and after which they were were uh, were uh, fated to be so bitterly disappointed. <laughs> no. Uh, one more quick question. I've done photo list. How I know you can't explain this to me probably, but with a substrate that thin. I'm just trying to picture how it would survive even the photolith process. It's just, you said uh, it was a wizard, but... <laughs> no, no, the, the wafer, since you know, and, and by the way, he is an expert on photolithography. I'm very much an observer on horseback. Uh, the wafers that we start with are standard uh, silicon on uh, insulator wafers. Okay. So they are not. Yeah. They are. They are closer to a millimeter thick. Okay, a standard mm -hmm. wafer then. They are a standard wafer, but in the reactive ion etching, first you you produce a uh, a photo mask by the mm -hmm. traditional fit. It's in fact contact produced photo mask. Uh, photo mask. You spin on the photoresist, you expose it, do all the usual things. Then uh, it's not a chemical etch, it's this reactive ion etching. And so the 25 microns of silicon, what happens is 
the whole wafer starts mm -hmm. to get eaten away mm -hmm. by the ion beam. Mm -hmm. And the parts uh, that are, are going to be holes get selectively etched, mm -hmm. and the other parts get less etched. Okay, so but the takes it, it down. Everything gets, everything gets etched until only 25 uh, microns of silicon is left, and the holes are straight through. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Okay. Damn. That's, that's the magic. Don't ask me how he controls it. And not only that, if you look at a, a photo micrograph, you can even get nice, straight, beautiful holes. I don't know how he does it. Wow. wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tell him wow. I'm impressed. <laughs> we'll be happy to do that. Thank you. Good question. One general okay. question. Um, at JPL several years ago, I saw two satellites, uh, a, a mock up, I think, of two satellites that were flying in formation. And I don't know what that was now. Was GPS, that? probably. Yeah, that was probably the, the terrestrial uh, the pathfinder for the terrestrial pathfinder. 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 Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Yeah. yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, TPF was a. Was a Big telescope. Uh, it was going to cost uh, lots of lots of money. Uh, I had an interest in it. I even I went to a couple of meetings at JPL to talk about aspects of it, but it was just too darn expensive. It will be done. Some aspects of TPF will be done by we hope by a mission called W First Star Mask, uh, which is an Exactly, which is uh, an exciting mission, which was uh, just canceled in the president's budget. So, but don't worry, don't worry. It hasn't gotten to Congress yet. And there's there's a whole another level of formation flying that that can't even be talked about in the same uh, vocabulary, and that's uh, what's necessary for Lisa the gravitational wave interferometer, mm -hmm. because there you are trying to determine uh, relative movements, not of the spacecraft, but of little free-floating balls inside it to picometers. It's astonishing technology. That uh, sounds like another talk. It's a wholly different talk by a wholly different person. It's very <laughs> interesting and exciting, but it's... Uh, this is the, the science is different, the scale is different, and the cost is vastly different. <laughs> and for me, it's like a giant FTS in space. I, I expect it would be for you, but then <laughs> you have a unique perspective. What's well, not to love? Doug, thank you so much. Thank you. And we look forward to uh, seeing you out here next month. Uh, make sure to uh, give us some warning, and uh, we'd love to show you through the observatory here. And, I will do it. And mm -hmm. like all our speakers, you can't get out of it. You're now an honorary member of the organization here. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. As I said, I was a member of, I went to Star Party, so it's going back to my barely remembered years. <laughs> Doug, take care, and have a good night. Okay. Thanks so much.